The Whitney Reynolds Show is supported by Reach Out Community Center. Reach out and help one child at a time. Hi, I'm Whitney Reynolds, and today we're talking about the tough and controversial topic of autism. You're watching The Whitney Reynolds Show. What is autism? Many people have different beliefs on how it is developed, is there a cure, and how to avoid it. Today, Julia Bradovic is going to explain this disorder and what she's learned firsthand and in the field. Julie, thank you so much for coming on and educating us on autism. It's a tough topic because there's a lot of controversy around it. What is some of the controversy? Well, at its core, the controversy is what is autism? Um, you have two very different schools of thought right now. One of those is that autism is a genetic disorder that has always been a part of the human condition and that there's really not much that you can do for it other than accept it and, and try to provide enough therapies so that your child can hopefully participate in society in some sort of meaningful way. Then there's a completely different school of thought that flips that on its head and says that's absolutely wrong. Autism is actually an epidemic. There's no such thing as a genetic epidemic. There is something environmental involved here and that ultimately this is a medical condition that can be treated, it can be prevented, and it actually can be reversed. Is it covered by insurance if it is considered a medical? Well, currently it's not considered a medical disorder. So that is part of the problem that a lot of parents are facing is that their children are presenting with significant medical problems, whether it be gastrointestinal issues that they're having, uh, toxicological issues that they're having. And so if you are able to treat those individually, then it depends on your insurance carrier. But if you were to give it the broad category of autism, the answer is no. And whenever you say parents face, you've actually faced this personally. You yes. have it. 12 year old daughter and in your when we were talking about you leading up to this interview we said that she's taken strides towards a recovery yes what does that look like well if you take the position which was what our reality was was that our daughter was actually very sick um, it's like recovering from any illness you know if you um, treat it and you get to the root of what's actually going on and you um, are able to properly implement you know different uh, medications and therapies and so forth to to help alleviate whatever was causing those problems then eventually it looks like you're getting your child back. Autism does come in many different shades. Some people have a form of it that with their child they're able to lead a fairly normal life and there may be some social issues they have to encounter and some other things but ultimately they're having a normal life. Um, there are some families who are absolutely suffering and their children have no services. They are severely impacted by their autism and they have nowhere to go. And we mentioned earlier, this isn't being covered by insurance in many instances. Um, schools are overwhelmed. They don't necessarily know what to do with this. I mean, they're getting better, but you add all of that together, all of the stress, all of the heartbreak, um, and people are snapping. And, right. and it's bound to happen again. Well, it can be very expensive, but there mm -hmm. are some programs out there to help parents. You're associated with one of them. Give us a brief little summary. Okay, well, Generation Rescue um, it is an organization that was formed in the mid-2000s, and its purpose primarily was to let parents know that, much like my experience, there were things that you could do. And so they have really paved the way. They've been doing a great job of uh, fundraising and getting money back into the hands of parents to put them on the path to recovery. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. People like you and people like Generation Rescue clearing the path, helping out others. Yes. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. Thank you for having me. Now it's time for our social sizzle. Today we have a short video titled, What It's Like to Have a Brother with Autism by Spencer Cole Timmy. I'm Spencer Timmy. I'm 20 years old and my big brother Mitchell has autism. You know, people always ask me, Spencer, what is it like to have an autistic brother? Is it hard? Frustrating? Is it different? I kind of laugh at the question. I'm just like, no, not really. And I don't know. I mean, I guess it's different in that as an older brother, he doesn't really give me advice on women or he can't buy me alcohol. I never got beat up by him all throughout my childhood like most brotherly relationships. But we do have our own unique bond. And like normal siblings, he still definitely acknowledges that he is the big brother. 
whenever he says, Spencer is eaten by the shark, or him saying, Mitchell is a girl. He knows how to provoke a response from me, his way of taunting. He pretends to shoot me all the time in the hallway, and he has a vicious bear hug. Like normal siblings, we can get on each other's nerves, but we can always sort it out by having a wrestling match. But he's usually calling for mom and dad within a minute because he has zero resilience to tickling. Our relationship is special. Not one person understands him the way I do. Our bond is strong. He is the most important person to me. I will always protect him. And he is my brother. Mitchell is a special human being. And I don't mean it because he's autistic. I mean it because he is one of a kind. He never ceases to amaze me. You know, my mom told me when Mitchell was maybe eight or nine, my parents were told that my brother should stop his therapy because they believed he was never going to improve his speech, his ability to interact. They said he'd probably reached his max capacity. He proved them wrong. Last summer, he wrote a surfboard all by himself. He sang a song at his high school graduation and is even a gold medalist in the Special Olympics. When I ask him, what day did we do so-and-so? He'll give me the exact date, like, oh, October 7th, 1999. It's incredible. He can draw, cook, type, sing, surf, dance. He can pretty much do it all, but that's not the main reason why I think he's special. You know, he has this ability to make everyone around him happy. My family, my friends he meets, the people at the rec center he attends, his workplace, and especially me. He makes me a better person. He has taught me to find the joy in the little things. He has taught me patience, understanding, and perspective. Although I play the big brother role by the way I take care of him, I do look up to him. I learn from him every day. I think about this all the time. You know, I can't wait for him to be the best man at my wedding. When I have kids, their favorite Uncle Mitchell will always be up for watching Disney movies and playing pirates as their princesses with them. I'm so blessed to have him in my life. And here's to you, Mitchell. Thank you for being my brother and my best friend. So maybe in the end, with the question I had in the beginning, what is it like to have an autistic brother? Well, I do have an answer. It's incredible. Patty Vesquez is a mother, a writer, a comedian, a WGN radio host, but most importantly, an advocate for children with special needs. We're now here with Patty Vesquez, and your son has autism. Yes, he does. Tell us what that is like. Um, you know, it's because you never think it's going to ha happen to you. It's made my world a bigger place, and I say that when I do my shows, and it, I know it sounds cheesy or corny, but my son looks at the world differently. He wants to see what things sound like, what they feel like, what they look like. It, like, if he's looking at a tree, he wants to see the leaves, you know, from this angle and from this angle, and it makes me slow down. When we're at the beach, he watches the water, you know, pull away, and when it comes rushing back, he giggles. And you realize, well, you know what, that is amazing. You know, those are the kinds of right. things that have, have changed my world. It's also, you know, been a hard road because it's not what I expected. It's not what, no one plans for that. And you never know what's coming next and who's going to take care of him if he, if he isn't able to live independently. So when did you balance. find out he had autism? Well, Declan was born um, two weeks early, and he had a lot of complications. He wasn't able to breathe on his own, and uh, they had to put him on life support and keep him in the special care nursery, what we all know as the NICU, um, for about 28 days. And it wasn't until uh, he was not meeting his milestones that they really came in with specialists. They thought that maybe it was uh, his medical fra fragileness was a result of pneumonia and aspirating amniotic fluids. I know there's a lot of words. Yeah. Like, ah, it's so scary. It is. I mean, it's scary. Yeah. But, you know, being able to have this much distance and getting as far as we have, because I found out later that, that many of the specialists didn't expect him to survive. And not only has he survived, he's thrived. But um, when he was about three years old, they ran another test. And he had just started walking. And three years is really late for a child to start walking. Um, they ran a test and found that he was missing some fibers in his, uh, in the, it's called the corpus callosum. Mm. And then the connective fibers that, that attach to the right side to the left side of your brain. And that communication between those sides are necessary for cognitive development and uh, you know, for language development, for right. gross motor skills, fine motor skills. So basically what we have is a anatomical location for his autism, which is a lot different for a lot of other families. So they were able to run a test yeah. and say, 
this he is, has this autism, is, but this is why. This is why, exactly. Interesting. Yeah, because his behaviors are very autistic in nature, a lot of repetitive behaviors, um, uh, complications when it comes to making social attachments. Um, but then, but we don't know what he knows because he doesn't speak. He communicates in his own way. Okay. Um, so he'll point and he uses pictures. A lot of families use picture exchange, uh, which is called PECS. Um, but um, the thing is, like, I never thought, uh, you know, when you hear autism, you have all these, you know, wide range of what right. you've seen and what you've heard. And, you know, you, you start thinking, for me, I was like, what if I never hear him say mommy? And I never have. Um, but I thought, what if he never wants to hug me, but he loves to cuddle? So I got that. Got yeah, that. I got Checklist. that. And, uh, and, and when he was about four or five, I realized, like, I needed to be able to kiss him, and he wouldn't let me. So I would, and it was one of the things that I developed with him. I would say, mommy kiss, and he would lean his forehead <laughs> like this, and he would give me a cheek. And uh, just before Thanksgiving last year, he pulled me down. I was doing some writing, and he pulled me down to his level and was coming at me, like, really close. And I'm like, what are we doing? And he gave me my first kiss on the lips. So, oh. and that's the thing is, with for my family and a lot of people who are dealing with autism, like, you don't really know what, what are they taking in from the world? What is it, you know, how are they processing it? And that's the, that's the mystery of it. We're here today because you actually also have a radio show on WGN. Mm -hmm. You perform all the time. Have you been able to combine comedy mm -hmm. with um, kind of seeing a bright side of autism? I know, it's, hard, it's hard to yeah, imagine, I mean, isn't yeah. it? Um, when I started doing stand-up comedy, I always wanted to have a, I, I love the sense of realism that some comics bring to their shows, like Richard Pryor did that, you know, m very much of his own story. And I had a, uh, an aunt, uh, my Aunt Bernice, uh, had beaten breast cancer, and I decided I would start talking about women's health early in my career. And that, and some people would go, I don't know where she's going with that. But I got to the point where I would talk about mammograms and stirrups and like, if I'm gonna be in the stirrups, I'm bringing spurs, you know? So I feel like I'm in control of the situation. So I've always had that, like like some of those elements woven in where it's, um, you know, so kind of the scary stuff. Right. So with Declan, I talk about having two boys. You know, I talk a little bit about Griffin. And then I, I segue into saying he's the best big brother for his little brother Declan who has autism. And, I, and one of the things I try to tell people is that after show is people will come up to me and go, oh, I'm so sorry about your son. And I get that. I get the desire to want to show empathy or compassion. But for my family, Declan is our victory, not our tragedy. Typically, we do man on the street, but today we wanted to hear from teachers that work with students with autism. We asked them, in their educational field, what are their philosophy and goals with students with autism? I'm a high school special education teacher, and every day I ask myself the same questions. Um, what are my students' futures going to look like? What, are, what, are the, what dreams do they have for themselves? What are their parents' dreams for, that, for their child? Um, what type of work are they going to get into? Uh, and those are the, the questions and answers that, that really drive the education that I need to provide for them. Um, the biggest thing is the, the independent skills. Being able to function as an independent adult is, is 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 primary. Uh, we work on the community life skills. We work on the daily living skills, being able to clean around the house. Um, we work on hygiene skills. We work on the functional and social communication, uh, the conversational skills, uh, understanding social uh, rules, and uh, expressing wants and needs. Um, uh, expanding beyond their vo their vocational experiences and their work skills too, so so they can hold a. a uh, employment in the future. Um, and one of the biggest areas is, is the coping skills, being able to independently manage their behavioral and sensory needs. Um, and not just in the classroom, but beyond my classroom, be in the home, in the community, when we go out and go to restaurants and the grocery store, um, at home with their parents. Sometimes their parents are, you know, looking for us to an for answers and, you know, that's what we need to do is to provide those answers for them. Um, at, at, in work, work is a huge thing. They can't have tantrums. They can't, um, you know, uh, be aggressive at work. They, they have to be able to independently manage themselves and, and implement the strategies that they know how to use to calm themselves down and be able to continue their work. My primary philosophy when working with my students is establishing a relationship with them. I know throughout the course of the day and through the year that we're going to be really tackling some tough behaviors. And it's really important that they know that I care about them and that, that I'm going to be there for them and that we're going to have fun together. Um, so that's my primary philosophy is just to, know that they, to let them know that I care. Um, in terms of my goals, my primary goals are, of course, establishing life skills. They have to have so many skills to be able to become a productive adult when they're older. Um, so it's my goal to make sure that during the day that we're working on these skills so that they can accomplish those goals. 
Um, my second thing that I really want to work on with my students is to establish a mode of communication. A lot of my students don't have verbal communication. It's imperative to me and my staff that we find a means for them to be able to communicate their wants and needs and their desires. So if that means teaching more verbal language and expanding their sentences, or if that means having a device, a communication device, to help them use a voice that they don't have, or even using pictures to have functional communication. Um, if you don't have communication, you can't share your wants and needs and desires. If you don't have communication, you're going to establish a lot more negative behaviors. Um, so my goal is to always allow them to have a voice. Once they have their voice, then I'm going to see a decrease in behavior, which is going to be beneficial not only for me and for their parents, but also for them as well. Um, and that's really my main philosophy and goals for my students. It is a wonderful experience to work with them. Um, every day is something new. Um, you never know what you're going to get. Um, with working with them, you meet with the families, you meet as a team to really help them um, post-22, like what their life is going to be like. So what we do is we look at their life and look at what they're going to be doing, and then we figure out, OK, they're going to be doing this. Let's work on this in high school. Um, and really, one of my biggest things is working on change because students with autism have trouble with change. They, everything needs to be in a routine for them. Well, that's great, but life is not always so routine. So my job as a teacher is to be like, hmm, let's change it up today a little bit and give them strategies while they're with me as a teacher. And then once they get into the real world, then they can handle it. They can go, oh, this is a change. I can do X, Y, and Z. So um, it's working with families and helping them out. It's um, working on the social skills that they need and communication that they need. It's incredibly rewarding. I enjoy creating activities for students that allow them to participate to their full potential in their classroom, as well as in my therapy office. So in my office, it might look like helping them build peer relationships, sometimes programming devices for them to use, or even switching up their sentence structures. Um, when I'm in their classroom, I help to modify assignments, give them directions visually, make picture cards, give them a schedule so that they can follow directions and know what's expected in their day. And the high school level, the goals stay meaningful, but they switch to community-based instruction of generating grocery lists, paying bills, getting a library card, making a bank deposit. It all depends on what's needed for the individual student. But I'd say the ultimate goal is just to make them feel comfortable and give them credit where credit is due so that they maintain friends and they're successful in their classroom settings. It looks and feels like Walgreens, but this prototype store is a world-class training center for people with autism. Opened recently, it is already having an effect across the community. Welcome to the show, you two. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Steve, you are with Walgreens, and Tom, you're with Have Dreams. Tell us how this partnership works. I'll toss it to you first. Okay. Well, about a year ago, Have Dreams approached Walgreens with the idea of training young people for employment skills. And so over the course of this past year, a lot of really amazing developments have occurred in our facility as a result of our partnership with Walgreens. One of those has been to establish an actual retail skills training center at Have Dreams in Evanston. How did Walgreens, did you already have a program for people with disabilities before Have Dreams came into the picture? We did. In fact, it was a continuation of our disabilities initiative effort in our distribution centers, uh, which began as an idea in 2002, formally launched in 2007. And we decided that we needed to extend that model to our retail, to our stores, environments. So Have Dreams trains how many people? We train small numbers of people at a time, but since our retail training center opened in March, we've trained a dozen people. And our young people are currently at different stages of their training. Some are still working in the retail center to build their independent skills. And others have really moved on to the next phase, which is actual in-store experience. You know, today's topic was on autism, and we've been talking from the mom's perspective, the siblings, teachers that work with them, and now we're training them to go out in the workplace. What is that like for Walgreens? It affects us on several levels. The, the first is the impact that it has on our business. 
Uh, we found this particularly in our distribution centers where a number of people employed in those centers uh, are somewhere on the autism spectrum. And their, their approach to learning, uh, the standardization that they need and seek in, in most environments lend themselves well to employment in distribution centers which are very time sensitive environments, things have to be executed at a very specific time and that's how a lot of people on the autism spectrum function. So training people with disabilities can be difficult because when you do disabilities it's just an overall cloud. It's, it, could be, it, it could be multiple things. How do you handle that? You, have, you work with people with autism and other disabilities as well? Well, Have Dreams is a not-for-profit that has been around for about 17 years and our sole mission is around children and young adults with autism. So when we developed the partnership with Walgreens, it was really to be able to take the training uh, and the initiative that they've already been working on and be able to adapt that for young people with autism in our training center. What's one of your favorite stories of someone coming out of this program going to work? It was something that I saw firsthand uh, at our distribution center in uh, Windsor, Connecticut. And uh, I was watching, in essence, uh, someone who had a disability receive their first paycheck. They were 41 years old. And their entire life, they thought, and so did uh, their parents, that employment was never going to be a possibility for them. We all remember getting our first paycheck in some way, shape, or form. The independence it gave you, uh, the autonomy, freedom to make choices. And uh, yet we know at an early age we're going to experience that at some point. Well, imagine if you never thought it was possible. And then you realize that now that it is. So you're watching the individual who has the, that disability experience that and then you have a, a completely different reaction from the parent. Uh, many uh, parents uh, who have children who are disabled have a privately held wish, and, and it is that they want to outlive their child. If you think about that for a minute, uh, that you want your child to go before you do, and they say that because their fear that no one will be around to take care of their son or daughter. When you're watching them get uh, their, their first check and then watching the parents realize it's okay now. They're going to be okay now. That, well, that's magical. Giving them some independence. That's, that really is magical. I think that's the right word to sum it up. Have dreams before you teamed up with Walgreens. What did it look like before this partnership happened? Well, really, much of our um, service focus was really on younger children. So early elementary and over that 17-year period that we've been in existence, we've seen a lot of these young children grow up from the 1990s and move all the way through the public school system and at some point that yellow bus doesn't show up anymore and it's sort of like now I'm an adult and I'm moving toward whatever it might take to be independent, to have a social life, to have a job and to be able to just live on my own without depending on adults. That's an interesting concept. Do you want to follow up with that? Yeah, part of what has formed this partnership uh, has been uh, the philosophy that we applied from uh, the very start, which is that we wanted to have the same job performed at the same level of performance with the same pay. And oftentimes when you, as a, an employer of our size, over 250,000 people, 9,000 locations, and you say that you have a very active effort around employing people with a disability, uh, they often think that this is a charitable endeavor. Uh, and we've said, although it certainly has that effect and we're proud to be associated with that effect, uh, we've also abided by that philosophy. So there wasn't the need to lower standards. There wasn't the need to expect a different level of performance. Certainly the individual with a disability doesn't want that right. and neither do the parents. That is amazing. So they come in, they get trained. What does the training, like you just give them hands-on skills? Is it? Well, the, the amazing thing about our partnership with Walgreens is that they've helped us create an actual simulated store oh. in our site at Evanston. And so um, it's always, I think I get a really big kick out of when we bring visitors to our center that they walk through the doors of that training facility and they actually think for a few moments they're in an actual real Walgreens I'd store. Probably, I'd probably be looking for the milk. So it, it <laughs> has, um, it's stocked with all the merchandise, all the departments you would find in a Walgreens. It's smaller scale, it's simulated. So in our environment, what we focus on first is teaching those skills to an independent level in a more stress-free environment. So when someone's ready to move to the next level, that's where we network with the store managers in our community. 
and they actually go and apply for an internship. They do an interview with the store manager. And if they're accepted for that internship, then they actually start to get work experience in the real environment. So there's no cutoff time. They need to know this by a certain date. It's really, we individualize it. So we follow uh, the retail employees training program from Walgreens. We've adapted it for young people with autism. And we really individualize that, but we target the same skills in the Walgreens training program. We assess their progress along the way. And when someone reaches the independent level to be able to go out and carry through with a lot of the work tasks in a fluid, automatic kind of way, and they feel confident about that, then we take them to the next level in the store. You know, this is, this is a great segment because, Steve, I think you nailed it on the head when you said, you're a big company, 250,000 workers work for Walgreens and that you don't want it to feel like a charity and I think that's what we've kind of walked people through today is that having autism or another disability is really tough but you can make it through it and there is light at the end of the tunnel. Well yeah. thank you both for coming on. You're thank welcome. You. For more information on today's show or our other health related topics go to thewhitneyreynoldshow.com. The Whitney Reynolds Show is supported by Reach Out Community Center. Reach out and help one child at a time.